Hello, BookTube. We are continuing with a chapter-by-chapter -chapter read along of uh, The Lord of the Rings. This was not planned by me at all, but I've sort of fallen into it and I'm very much enjoying the experience. So I'm going to continue just doing a chapter every, maybe every day or every day when I can do it. And we are all the way to The Return of the King, which is the third part of this book. Lord of the Rings is actually one book. But The Return of the King is the third part of the book, often sliced off into being the third volume in a trilogy. And by this point, the backstory that we have been covering, I'm assuming that no one is interested in this video who has not seen other videos or does not know the story, the backstory is almost impossible to synopsize quickly. Because the action has split and split and split. And that's that's tricky. We we started out with a fellowship of the ring, all the heroes of the story in one place. That fellowship fractured right away and has just continued to fracture. For instance, we have we have two different battles that are being waged here. One is supernatural and one is military. They are in separate places and they are completely separate narrative strands. Tolkien is not bouncing back and forth between them with any kind of rapidity. You get blocks with one and then blocks with the other. The supernatural one is the, the hobbit Frodo and his servant Sam and the creature Gollum, who are walking on foot, unguarded, the one ring, Sauron's one ring, the ring of, the, of Sauron, the, the lord of the rings, into his kingdom, into this, his stronghold, uh, to Mount Doom, Mount Doom in order to destroy the ring, in order to throw it into the molten lake where Sauron originally forged it. They want It is imbued with a huge amount of his power, and they want it destroyed. They want it out of consideration anymore. They, they, for, not good enough for them is burying it or hiding it for a generation. They want this evil removed from the world. And Gandalf and the other wise members of the White Council decide that that must be the reason why this came to light in the first place. It is their duty to do. Uh, that's the supernatural strand, and we're not dealing with that at this part of Return of the King. Instead, we're dealing with the military side of things, because in addition to being a supernatural threat, a dark lord, a being who is not human, Sauron is also a very much warmongering terrestrial warlord. And his kingdom of Mordor abuts against the greatest kingdom of men, Gondor, and its capital city of Minas Tirith. And Sauron is amassing forces, a huge amount of forces, to, to destroy Gondor. And all of our heroes now know that. Gondor's defenses must be shored up, and it rendered any help that it can be rendered. And for that purpose, we have a group of people headed there. We have one of the other hobbits, one who is not Sam or Frodo, with the armed forces of Rohan, Gondor's neighboring kingdom and ally, are headed there. They are headed to Gondor to help out. Uh, Gandalf, the wizard, it takes another hobbit and heads to Gondor at extreme speed on his mighty stallion Shadowfax in order to help out. Faramir, the son of the steward of Gondor, Gondor has no king. Gondor is the ancient kingdom of the men of the West and has been waiting all of these centuries for the return of its king and has decided, the Gondorian leadership, the council and whatnot, has decided the leader of Gondor, the lord of the city, will be the steward of Gondor. He will be holding it in trust for someone else, but he will not call himself a king. And unbeknownst to the current steward of Gondor, at least at first, the king of Gondor, the, the heir to the, the founders of the city, is Aragorn, who was a member of the Fellowship of the Ring, and is making his own way to Gondor, because that's yet another strand of the narrative here, is that God, Aragorn has decided he has learned by using one of the Palantir, these mystic seeing stones that can communicate one with the other, and one of them is possessed by Sauron, the Dark Lord, in Barad-dûr. Aragorn comes into possession of another one and is able to use it to tell that a gigantic military blow is headed for Gondor. Quickly. He needs to get there quickly and with a large amount of forces. So he has to take yet a third route and he is accompanied not only by his fellow Dunedain but also by the dwarf Gimli and the elf Legolas. So we have one plot line after another. Our main characters are all converging on Gondor, all except Sam and Frodo. But they're converging from different places, and that makes it a mess of a thing to synopsize. In the strand that we are dealing with today, this, the, the story, the chapter that we're dealing with today is the Siege of Gondor. 
and this is the Siege of Minas Tirith, where the forces coming out of Mordor are acting quickly and uh, with a, a great degree of urgency. Now, we, as readers, already have an idea of why that might be true. And uncannily, in this chapter, Gandalf guesses why that might be true. He doesn't know. But he guesses that Aragorn used the Palantir to show himself to Sauron. Which you might, if you're not familiar with the book, you might think, well, so what? So you, you show the, the Dark Lord of Mordor, who's not even human, one that one human has possession of another Palantir. But no, it's much more important than that. It's not just any human. It's the heir of Isildur. It's a human who is who is the rightful owner of all the Palantirs and actually is able to wrest the stone away from the control of, of Sauron. Uh, we know that Aragorn showed himself to Sauron in the Palantir. We, we get a very vivid description of how utterly exhausted the experience left him. He says that he had enough strength, but only barely. And Gandalf guesses that, that that must be the reason why Sauron has accelerated his war-making and is sending a huge gout of forces against Gondor, against Minas Tirith. But the why scarcely matters when you're in a city that is, that is being besieged and that is, looks like it's going to fall. It doesn't look like Gondor is strong enough to hold out. The the uh, people of Gondor that we meet in the city during this chapter are constantly wondering if Rohan will arrive, if armed forces from Rohan will arrive, and if they'll arrive in time. Uh, because the the city is is facing military defeat, not only from the vast amount of Sauron's conventional forces, but also from a supernatural element. His Nazgul, his nine riders that we met all the way back in the Fellowship of the Ring, when they were on just plain old horses, are now mounted on winged beasts. And they wield terror around them like a cloud. It's, their, it's, it's not just a question of seeing someone on a winged beast, it's that they're terrifying supernaturally. Uh, and they are attacking the city as well. And we get that in this chapter. Faramir only barely survives an encounter with one of these things. And... Uh, uh, there's a wonderful moment where the hobbit Pippin is looking from the parapets of the city and looks down at Faramir's forces that are barely, tr they're trying to get back to the city and they're being harried by these winged Nazgul until help comes from the White Rider. Help comes from Gandalf, who's no longer Gandalf the Grey. He's Gandalf the White. He is far more powerful than he once was. He actually tells that. To, our, to uh, some of our other characters. He tells them, I'm far more dangerous than anything you will ever encounter unless you're brought alive before the Dark Lord. That's a big claim, and we've seen it substantiated, but never more directly than in this moment where Pippin is looking down. Uh, but now the dark, swooping shadows were aware of the newcomer. One wheeled toward him, the newcomer is Gandalf on Shadowfax. One wheeled toward him, but it seemed to Pippin that he raised his hand, and from it a shaft of white light stabbed upwards. The Nazgul gave a long, wailing cry and swerved away, and with that the other four wavered, and then rising on swift spirals they passed away eastward, vanishing into the lowering cloud above, and down on the Pelennor it seemed a while le uh, for a while less dark. The Pelennor is the, the great expanse of field uh, outside of, of Minas Tirith. And when the Faramir, who is the brother of one of the members of the Fellowship of the Ring, we've met him before, we've met him in chapters with Sam and Frodo, he's just met Sam and Frodo just a couple of days ago, he's come from there. That's how close our heroes come to each other in the course of, in the climax of this book, one of the climaxes of this book. And uh, this is Pippin's first real glimpse of Faramir, and it is wonderful. We have talked before about how in The Lord of the Rings, sometimes especially maybe called forth by the seriousness of the events here at the end of the Third Age, some old bloodlines have become revived. We get the strong impression that, that Faramir, for instance, is truer to the blood of Numenor than a lot of his antecedents would have been. Gandalf says that that's true of Faramir's father, Denethor. We know that's true of Shadowfax. Gandalf's horse, who is unlike any horse who's been seen in thousands of years. We get the strong impression that's true of Aragorn. That he's not just the heir of Isildur, but is a throwback, I guess is what I'm talking about. And Pippin sees that in a wonderful little passage here. 
Pippin pressed forward as they passed under the lamp beneath the gate arch, and when he saw the pale face of Faramir, he caught his breath. It was the face of one who has been assailed by a great fear or anguish, but has mastered it, and now is quiet. Proud and grave he stood for a moment as he spoke to the guard, and Pippin, gazing at him, saw how closely he resembled his brother Boromir, whom Pippin had liked from the first, admiring the great man's lordly but kindly manner. Yet suddenly for Faramir his heart was strangely moved with a feeling that he had not known before. Here was one with an air of high nobility such as Aragorn at times revealed. Less high, perhaps, yet also less incalculable and remote. One of the kings of men born into a later time, but touched with the wisdom and sadness of the elder race. That's, that's neat not only for what it shows us about Faramir, but also for what it tells us about Aragorn, which is that he can be a little bit much. <laughs> uh, and Faramir has has bad news to report about the outlying districts of, of Minas Tirith, of the outlying districts of Gondor, and naturally he has to report that to his father Denethor, who has been, un, his reason has been slightly unseated in his, his un, overwhelming grief at the loss of his son Boromir. And there's a tense scene, Gandalf accompanies Faramir to talk with Denethor, and there's a very tense scene in which we see that it's not just sadness at missing Boromir, that's bothering Denethor. It's something else. And it's horrifying. In my mind, this is one of the most terrifying moments in The Return of the King, just, believe it or not, despite all the other high-profile stuff that's going on. Uh, uh, Denethor says about Boromir, he's missing that Boromir is there. He wishes that Faramir had died in his place. And of Boromir, he says, he would have brought me a mighty gift. He repeats it. He says that, that would that, the, that this thing had come to me, meaning the One Ring, which Boromir tried to take from Frodo by force and died for it and, and, and regretted it before he died. That is an astonishing thing for Denethor, who is a very powerful man, the most powerful human in Middle-earth, uh, to say that Boromir would have brought me a mighty thing. That is incredible. And Gandalf knows it and will not have it. He will not have it talked about this way. Gandalf says, comfort yourself. In no case would Boromir have brought it to you. He is dead and died well. May he sleep in peace, yet you deceive yourself. He would have stretched out his hand to this thing and taking it, he would have fallen. You would have, he would have kept it for his own. And when he returned, you would not have known your son. You immediately start imagining that the horrifying scenario that Gandalf is only hinting at there, that when he returned, you would not have known your son. He would have just handed this thing over to you. And uh, Denethor is scornful. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't like Gandalf anyway. He doesn't like the fact that Faramir listens to Gandalf and is a so-called wizard pupil. And uh, they have an unbelievably tense exchange here. Denethor says, And where will other men look for help if Gondor falls? If I had this thing now in the deep vaults of this citadel, we should not then shake with dread under this gloom, fearing the worst, and our counsels would be undisturbed. If you do not trust me to endure the test, you do not know me yet. And Gandalf responds right away, right there, right in his face. Nevertheless, I do not trust you, said Gandalf. Had I done so, I could have sent this thing hither to your keeping and spared myself and others much anguish. And now, hearing you speak, I trust you less, no more than Boromir. Nay, stay your wrath. I do not trust myself in this, and I refuse this thing even as a freely given gift. You are strong and can still in some matters govern yourself, Denethor, yet if you received this thing it would have overthrown you. Were it buried beneath the mountains of Mindoluin, still it would burn your mind away as the darkness grows, and yet worse things follow that soon shall come upon us. Flat out tells him to his face, I don't trust you any more than I trusted Boromir. <laughs> with the possession of this thing, with the temptation of this thing. Uh, and the uh, the interview ends. It's, it's uh, it, a lot is packed into this chapter. Faramir goes to shore up the defenses of an outlying district and is wounded. He, he barely makes it back. And is... Uh, He's unconscious, and he's under the uh, he's under Denethor's care. And we're told something about Denethor that I want to I want to highlight it here because 
it's going to inform a question that I want to ask you. Uh, uh, Denethor tells them to, to make a bed ready for Faramir and lay him upon it. Uh, but he himself went up alone into the secret room under the summit of the tower, and many who looked up thither at that time saw a pale light that gleamed and flickered from the narrow windows for a while, and then flashed and went out. And when Denethor descended again, he went to Faramir and sat beside him without speaking, but the face of the Lord was gray, more death-like than his son's. That's very familiar. We've heard that description before. That is a, the exact description uh, of Aragorn when he uses the Palantir. He's exhausted. He only barely sufficed. And we learn later on in, Lord, in The Return of the King that Denethor has one too and has been using it. Uh, <laughs> we'll get back to that, but first, the, the conventional forces of, of Mordor attack Minas Tirith. They use the great battering ram Grand. And they eventually shatter the doorway. They shatter the main entrance to the citadel. The whole place is, is on the verge of being overrun. The citadel, the citadel doors are shattered, and the leader of Mordor's forces, the captain of the Nazgul, the witch king of Angmar, the head of the Nazgul, appears in the doorway. And although there's panic all around him, remember he wields fear like a weapon, there's one obstacle in his path. Uh, and it, it is a great moment. Uh, in rode the lord of the Nazgul, a great black shape against the fires beyond he loomed up, grown to a vast menace of despair. In rode the lord of the Nazgul, under the archway that no enemy had ever yet passed, and all fled before his face. All save one. There waiting, silent and still in the space before the gate, sat Gandalf upon Shadowfax, Shadowfax, who alone among all the free horses of the earth endured the terror, unmoving, steadfast as a graven image and wrath in him. You cannot enter here, said Gandalf, and the huge shadow halted. Go back to the abyss prepared for you. Go back, fall into the nothingness that awaits you and your master. Go. The black rider flung back his hood, and behold, he had a kingly crown, and yet upon no head visible was it set. The red fire shone between it and the mantled shoulders vast and dark. From a mouth unseen there came a deadly laughter. Old fool, old fool, this is my hour. Do you not know death when you see it? Die now and curse in vain. Then with his lifted, with his lifted high his sword and flames ran down the blade. And some of you, if you've seen the, uh, the director's cut, the extra scenes for Peter Jackson's adaptation of Return of the King, will recognize that moment vaguely because the moment when the stronghold of Minas Tirith is pierced at, by the, the Witch King of Angmar, by the, the Lord of the Nazgul, and he confronts Gandalf, that moment is one of the rare instances in the Peter Jackson's Return of Lord of the Rings adaptations where he simply flubs, where he simply botches it where ordinarily he has a preternaturally keen ear for what Tolkien is doing well, for Tolkien's own instinct for drama. And in, ordinarily he is able to do it beautiful justice, which is why these movies are so beloved. But in that moment is totally ruined. I'm glad it wasn't in the theatrical version. But I've seen the, the extended version scene, and it is ridiculous. Gandalf is simply defeated, easily defeated. There is no defeat here in the book. Gandalf's ability to fight this being is not tested. And I hate to say it, or maybe I don't hate to say it, there was an old animated version of The Lord of the Rings. And it's widely mocked for some of its primitive visual effects. But the moment that's being described here, where the Witch King enters Minas Tirith and is confronted by Gandalf, is beautifully done. It's just beautifully done. It's far better than the movie version that Peter Jackson did with 100 million times the budget. <laughs> we are not supposed, Gandalf is not supposed to be defeated. He can be defeated by Sauron. He can't be defeated anymore by Sauron's, by Sauron's henchmen or by anything else. We don't get the moment because just when the Witch King raises his blade, horns sound. And this is accurate in the movie as well. It, horns sound because Rohan has come at last. And that is that is the uh, 
the conclusion of the Siege of Gondor, the next chapter is the Ride of the Rohirrim, which is in the climax of this narrative strand of the Return of the King. There's another narrative strand that we're going to get to that, of course, has a climax of its own, but this, the Siege of Gondor leading up to it is wonderfully done. First of all, it's packed full of stuff. It makes up for the previous chapter where not much happens. And it sets the stage perfectly for the next chapter. Uh, and when I'm reading the book, the, this book that I've read so many times and loved so well, I don't have to think about Peter Jackson's weird flubbing of this scene. He should not have flubbed this scene. He, he gets it wrong in his movie in the extended version in every way, including that it's, it's, it's not grand, it's not a broken doorway, it's not, it's not an ambiguous confrontation, it's nothing like that. It's a uh, weak, it's a weak moment in the extended version. But anyway, that's, that's going to do it for this chapter, and then we move on to a humdinger of a chapter next time, The Ride of the Rohirrim. Oh my. Uh, so we've got some great chapters ahead of us here. Uh, I'm going to wrap this up for now, but I'll come back to this, and I will see you then. Thank you, Booktube.